it's the stitches and i've been gone there was a bit of a delay in this video initially because I wanted to have my silver play button to unbox so that this video wasn't literally just me answering month-old questions, but that didn't happen. First, YouTube never sent me the code to redeem the silver play button initially. Basically how it works is when your channel hits 100k subscribers, it automatically undergoes automated review. Then after a certain period of time, you should be sent a code with which you can go to like a website that YouTube has where you can redeem an award. YouTube says that it should only take about three weeks and I waited much longer than three weeks. So I decided to reach out to YouTube creator support. After I got an email back from them, I did end up getting a code and I redeemed my award. And then UPS proceeded to misdeliver it to a house, another town over. So I don't know where my creator award is, but I certainly don't have it. I reached back out to YouTube and I got kind of a semi-cryptic response that basically amounted to, I'm going to hand this off to somebody with a higher pay grade than me. And that person hasn't responded to me yet. Maybe one day I will have a silver play button, <laughs> but that day is not today. But it's not the end of the world. I mean, having a hunk of whatever it is that YouTube play buttons happen to be made out of doesn't make the fact that I did in fact reach 100k subscribers any less real. I know the cliche is that you're not supposed to care about likes or subscribers or really anything to do with social media, but at the same time, um, 100k is higher than the population of the city that I actually do live in, and that kind of means something to me. I'm still very deep in denial though. Like, for reference, my high school graduating class was 112 people. Having this many eyes on my content is very deeply unfamiliar and uncomfortable, so my brain is pretending that it just doesn't exist. So thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart to all 100k imaginary people that subscribe to me. Why would you do that? But I imagine the majority of you did not come here for whining or bragging. You came here to see how much I can embarrass myself with your questions. So let's get to some of those. First, I'm going to be starting with the questions that were asked on the YouTube community tab. What were some of the most surprising things you've learned about mending, sewing, or in costuming school, etc. Um, I think the biggest and most surprising thing, learning that actually nobody has ever had an original thought ever was kind of a blow to the ego. My fashion history class in college was pretty eye-opening. Even things like platform shoes can be dated back thousands of years. No trend is actually new. Everything that you see is simply a continuation of what came before you. Like literally everything. Even prior to the art and fashion that we have now, like the original art and fashion was created inspired by the natural world. For example, we consider colors like purple to be especially royal because they were really rare in nature and they were incredibly difficult dye colors to create. And then when we started making really futuristic fashions in the 50s during the atomic age, we based all of those funky shapes off of the, at the time, new scientific models of space and the atom. So literally all inspiration has come from something that you have seen or experienced. That doesn't give you license to just steal shit though. You at least have to try. You at least have to put your own spin on things, even when you do create derivative work. And if you do knowingly take inspiration from someone else, you should at least try to cite your sources. But honestly, having to sit with the knowledge that no matter how hard you try, you are probably never going to create something truly original, and deciding that it's still worth it to try to do my own thing regardless really did help me become a better designer, I think. Do you like Pretty Cure? <sighs> I, um, I know Pretty Cure is basically like the Bible to some of you. I tried to like it. I watched several episodes of several seasons. I even watched a few seasons in their entirety. And it's just, it's not for me. It's not that I don't like Magical Girl anime. I mean, I grew up on sanitized versions of Sailor Moon and Cardcaptor Sakura that had all of the violence and 
none of the gay people. But Pretty Cure just kind of wasn't my thing. While I have already sufficiently let you down, I think this is a good time to break the news that I also wasn't very into Steven Universe. I like the idea of the show, I just kind of didn't find it charming enough to make up for the fact that that's just not my kind of humor. But I mean, children's animation in general just isn't really my thing. I like animation, I just prefer it when the jokes are intended to land with my age group. That's my opinion! What handmade item is your favorite to wear, and do you think you would ever try to achieve a wardrobe made of only handmade items? I have so many favorite handmade items. I really like my heart skirt with the red buttons. It's probably my most worn handmade item. I really love the sports bear dress that I just made. I also think my blue Lolita dress is a good contender for favorite item. The problem is that I'm kind of just really bad at picking favorite things in general. And as for the second part of that question, I really love making my own clothes. It gives me so much freedom over my style. If I wasn't able to just go to Goodwill and buy some bed sheets or some curtains or something and make it into anything I want, I would not be able to dress this way. But with that being said, I would never want a wardrobe that was only my own handmade pieces. Because there are simply just too many other cool designers out there. If I had more financial resources, I would be buying so many indie brands. I would be commissioning friends. I would just get so many things if I were to suddenly wake up and be fabulously wealthy. I also just really love vintage clothing and I like collecting clothes from different eras because it's interesting to see how different garments are constructed by different companies during different time periods. There's only so much you can learn about clothes from looking at pictures or just seeing it behind the glass in a museum. And I wouldn't want to like inadvertently get tunnel vision by putting myself in a little bubble of only consuming my own handiwork. Like I want to be able to look at different clothes and see the different ways that they're put together because that informs me in my own craft. I think having an entirely self-made wardrobe is a really novel idea, but in practice it just I don't think it would work out too well for me. If you had to make a garment out of Velveeta cheese, dry erase markers, or pine needles, which would you choose and what would it look like? Asking the real important questions I see. I would choose Velveeta and I would make it an homage to cheese zombies. Most of you probably don't know what a cheese zombie is, which I think is a crime against humanity. You know, you go into school and you're like, oh, it's pizza day. I'm actually gonna have something that tastes edible. Well, we had another thing in my school aside from pizza day and that was cheese zombie day. And cheese zombie day was better than pizza day because cheese zombies were made from scratch. At least I think they were. Actually, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure my school did the thing where they just bought frozen bread and Velveeta and just sandwiched the Velveeta between frozen bread. But like, it was still better than anything else we ate. I thought this was just a normal school cafeteria food that everyone had. I thought this was universal. And then one day I was bored and on Google and I discovered that cheese zombies are actually like specifically a Washington state thing. They were invented in my hometown. I had no idea. I really want to make a video making cheese zombies because my school actually gave us a recipe for them in like a life skills class because of course they did. But then I would actually have to go out into the world and get ingredients and then bring them back and then figure out a way to film in my kitchen that doesn't sound like garbage. I'm not sure what a cheese zombie garment would look like, but I imagined it would be heinous. It would be heinous. Wait a minute, there should be a commercial break here. I film in chunks and I just bumped my camera a little bit and I might have fucked up everything. When did you learn to sew? I know it takes time to master, but I mean, initially what got you into it? All right, buckle in because this is going to be a long story. I had an interest in sewing as early as like, I don't know, four, like as early as I have actual memories. When I was a kid, my mom sewed, my grandma sewed, and like every adult woman I knew could sew at least a little bit. Both of my grandmas were more into like yarn crafts. One of them was more into like crochet the other one knit and my mom was really into like cross stitch so like I was just surrounded by all sorts of crafting all the time I was especially interested in sewing specifically because my mom actually made a lot of my clothes growing up she'd take me to the fabric store with her and then we'd flip through like the pattern books together and we'd pick out patterns together and then she'd take me through the fabric aisles and then I'd be like I want this dress made out of this fabric and then she would make it for me and I would watch and I thought that was just like the whole process was just the coolest 
coolest thing to me ever. And then when I was like eight or so, I found a book in my grandma's house that was like a how to sew book for children. It was probably something my mom had when she was a kid. I actually looked it up and it's called Miss Patch's Learn to Sew Book. And according to some dead eBay link, it's from 1969. And I used it to learn how to make basic stitches and like how to make dolls and stuff. I don't really recommend that book because it is for literal children and it doesn't even like properly show you how to tie off your thread. But that was my introduction to sewing. Here we have a doll that I made in my teens, my early teens. I had no idea how to make doll hair so I just like put a knot in each individual strand of yarn and then sewed it on through the knot in the yarn. Sort of similar to how you would bead something. So I like stitched each individual hair to her scalp. <laughs> this was actually a replacement for a doll that was one of my first projects, but I had played with it so much that it literally fell apart. And then this, do I need to tag agoraphobia? This is a spider that I made when I was like, nine or 10. So this would have been one of my very first projects that I made all by myself. And I was very proud that I was clever enough to put a little bit for my finger for it to hang on. It originally had eight legs, but one of them has since fallen off. I started making full clothes for myself when I was like 13 or 14, you know, outside of making arm warmers or Halloween capes. And that was when my mom convinced me that I should learn how to use a sewing machine. My mom and my grandma kind of taught me how to do the basics, like how to thread the machine, how to sew straight lines, how to cut out a pattern and read the instructions. But for the most part, I was kind of just left to my own devices. This was the first garment that I thought I had made completely by myself, but I'm looking at the zipper in the back of it and it looks kind of suspiciously good. I'm fairly certain my mom must have helped me. Also like, this is literally quilting cotton. This is an, it by no means wearable. I did go to school for costume design. Well, I have a bachelor's in theater arts. That's like my degree. But while I was there, I specialized in costume design. But like, I still had to take classes for lighting and set design and basic introductory aspects of other areas of theater. But 90% of my classes were about sewing and fashion. And obviously I would say that that did help me improve my sewing skills. It helped me learn several new techniques that I. I had never thought of before and it helped me learn how to use different products that I had never had access to before and it did help break me of a lot of bad habits that I had developed. So I know that that isn't like a super neat answer. Um, basically I was just always around sewing and it gradually became a passion of mine until eventually I went to college for it and now uh, I I guess I run a sewing YouTube channel. You said in your bunny ear bonnet video, you plan on making a half bonnet video. Do you still plan on doing that? You know, you don't need to call me out like that. Uh, yes, eventually. I do still want a black half bonnet, so. I will be making one eventually, I just don't know when. I've also promised so many other videos in the past that I haven't made yet, but they're all just like on the back burner. So next we're gonna move on to the Instagram questions, but this video is very long already, so we're gonna move into a commercial break and then come right back. Instagram questions. When slash how did you first get into alternative fashion? which was a pretty frequently asked question. As I mentioned before, when I was a kid, I had a lot of handmade clothes and I started making my own clothes when I was a teen. So I've basically pretty much always been into some sort of alternative fashion. I think the first time I ever specifically heard the word gothic, I was in like, fourth grade. And that was like the first alternative fashion that I had ever taken an interest in. But like I said, it was also the first one that I had ever actually heard of. Basically the second I was like, oh, there are weird people. I realized that I too wanted to be a weird person. But I still also liked pink and glitter, but I feel like every millennial preteen girl went through a phase where the color pink was just abhorrent to them. I don't know, like I can dress like a normal person. I've done it. I just don't like it as much. What brought you to the more punk look we've seen lately? Um, I'm clearly just making my inner teenager happy. <laughs> I mean, didn't we all kind of revert to our middle school interests in quarantine? 
2019. I've been rebuilding my collection of darker clothing for a bit now, and I finally have like a comfortable capsule wardrobe that I can make all sorts of outfits with. And I think moving forward, I want to develop a personal style that's more of a hybrid between the two. Cause sometimes I just want to cover myself in glitter, and other times I just want to cover myself in spikes. And then sometimes I just want to cover myself in glitter and spikes. Favorite Bratz movie? Uh, worst injury you've gotten DIYing. There's a part in the True Cost documentary where somebody is trying to explain to us why they think garment workers don't deserve a living wage. Well, I mean, there's nothing intrinsically dangerous with sewing clothes. So. And the first time I watched it, I audibly laughed. What about a skill that utilizes sharp objects, hot surfaces, and heavy machinery would make you think that it's safe? So if you're squeamish, you might want to skip ahead or just go do something else. I purposefully made this the last question to make it easy to skip over. So in terms of injuries I've gotten while sewing, I've Definitely sliced myself open with the rotary cutter pretty bad before. I've definitely burned myself on the iron pretty bad before. <laughs> like when I was a teenager, I just didn't know, I, I didn't know how to physically keep my hand from going straight into where the iron was sitting. <laughs> But the worst injury I ever got honestly wasn't that serious. It was just kind of gross. Um, one time I like stabbed myself with a pin right up underneath my fingernail and the like little puncture wound that it left behind developed a tiny little bit of an infection. And I could see it was just like a white little like dot underneath my fingernail and it just hurt. It hurt and it felt like there was just a lot of pressure inside my finger. And so I'm, I'm a picker, unfortunately. I like physically could not leave it alone and I was just kind of like pushing on it a little bit. The white dot turned out to be a bubble of pus and it squeezed out from underneath my fingernail. Um, and I could see it like drain out like my fingernail was a little window. And um, I have never been more disgusted by my own body before. So that's a good place to end things. Right? Um, I hope that wasn't too much oversharing on the internet for one day. I know the end got a little bit graphic there. I just want to say again a huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed to my YouTube channel. Anyone who has watched one of my videos and then decided that they actually wanted to watch more for some reason, that was just really swell of you. Or maybe now you're so horrified by my fingernail story that you're gonna immediately unsubscribe. I wouldn't blame you. And with that, I hope everyone has had a good day and I'll see you all next time. Bye.